My name is E.S. Wynn, and this is the Midnight Writer Comedy Podcast. This is episode two, made uh, during, well, what most people would have is spring break, but since I'm not in school anymore, it, it's mostly just that wonderful period where I get a absolutely huge flood of submissions to my magazines. It seems like as soon as school lets out for the college kids and the high school kids, it's just, <laughs> here comes the flood of submissions. And you know, my first reaction to that is always, you know, one of total frustration. Oh my god, I just received ten submissions during the course of, you know, a five minute period. <laughs> here comes this flood of submissions. But you know, as I wade through them and I look at some and turn some away and find a few gems here and there. I look at my magazines and I start to think, you know, kind of like this. I would much rather be able to spend all my time working as a writer and spend no time at all working as an editor. But uh, it is nice to have something to sort of practice that that editorial art on. And uh, it is nice to have these floods of content in between the dry spells that randomly pop up that keep my keep my magazines uh, full of good material so I don't have to start taking crazy garbage that comes in. And there is some stuff that comes in which is absolutely insane. Don't get me wrong, most of the stuff that <clears throat> I reject from my magazines is uh, stuff like fiction and poetry that is just so full of grammatical errors and you know, those weird little grammatical errors where you're not sure the word that they chose could have been a typo, but it might not have been. It might have just been artistic license. They've got three of those in the first paragraph, you know. Some of the stuff that comes in, I'll read through it and I'll reject it just because of the fact that it's going to take me a good hour to clean all the errors out of it. And, you know, why would I take a piece of fiction unless the story is absolutely stellar, unique, and fresh, and comes in from a totally new angle? Why would I take a piece of fiction like that that's just totally just riddled with errors um, when there's plenty of other stuff coming in that's clean and pretty interesting? And I think a lot of editors probably think that way. I wouldn't be at all surprised. But that's, that's most of the stuff that I reject. There is a lot of stuff that I reject here and there which falls into the category of just poorly written. Most of the stuff I receive isn't poorly written. And by poorly written, I mean... Um, I'm one of those people who absolutely hates rhyming couplets. Absolutely hate rhyming couplets. You know, basically um, the kind of poetry which follows the same rules as uh, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, I come from Mars, so do you. Uh, A lot of the rhyming couplet poetry that comes in that people think they can just pass off to a magazine, especially magazines like mine, which are sort of geared towards you know, young writers and getting getting people's names out there, um, they think that they can just send you a, a poem that's all rhyming couplets where they're grasping for words and, and trying to find you know, the, the word that rhymes, but you read the sentence and it's all chopped up. It looks like something Yoda would say because the fact that they're trying to get that rhyming word in there at the end, you know, and it's it's amateur. It's absolutely amateur. And yes, I've done it. I've done it. Absolutely did it when I was in sixth grade. And don't let you know the age be a uh, you know a thing for you. But it is something that everyone goes through on their way to better things. So if you're sitting there right now and you're all pissed off, well, hey, I write all my poems in rhyming couplets. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you realize that it's just a milestone, a stepping stone to greater things. Poetry is not meant to be confined to just roses are red, violets are blue. Um, you gotta, you gotta experiment. You gotta try free form. You gotta try separating just one word from the line above it so that it creates a sort of poetic drop, a fall, a moment of emphasis in the in the poem. It's <laughs> it, it's the kind of thing that you know you can't do within the strictures of very fine metered uh, rhyming couplets. So that being said. Don't think that I'm totally, absolutely, 100% against rhyming couplets. I've seen it done great. I've seen it done well, very well. Tennyson does it great. Tennyson is just amazing with his rhyme scheme, with some of the poetry that that he wrote. 
you know, but he can do it. He sits down and he spends a month writing a poem. Well, he sat down. He's dead now, of course. But, you know, he'd sit down and spend a long time, you know, tinkering with this poem to get it to where every line flowed flawlessly, like normal speech, but artistic, and would end in such a way that it rhymed. Absolutely beautiful stuff, but it takes a lot of time to fashion a poem that's that artistic. It takes a lot of time to create something that beautiful. And most people just don't take the time. They want to crank out a poem in the course of a day or a week, and you know, I've, or a couple minutes. And uh, if you're going to crank out a poem in the course of a couple minutes, if you want it to be good, you don't want to have lines in there that, you know, follow some weird scheme like, uh, "Hey, babe, you are a dove. It is you that I love." Because that kind of poetry is just. It's just disgusting, in my opinion. It's absolutely disgusting. I do reject 99% of those that come in. The poor written, the poorly written, um, uh, rhyming couplet poetry. But, uh, when I say the really insane stuff, the stuff that comes in that I kind of read through it, what the heck is going on here? Uh, is is more stuff like there was this there was this um, short story that was sent to me, oh I guess it was probably a good four years ago now um, when my first magazine Weird Year uh, was relatively new and still a daily magazine at that time and uh, this this uh, female uh, storyteller kept sending it to me over and over and over again and she she just was convinced why wouldn't I publish it you know it was um, it was about a clown I don't remember all the details it was about a clown. And it was basically this clown was haunting this little girl and threatening to kill her. And, and uh, you know, she kind of interacted with it and all this. And I don't remember the details exactly, but I just remember reading this story and thinking, the story is so derivative of films like, you know, It, for example, or this sort of play with this clownophobia, you know, idea. Uh, already it's, it's derivative and not fresh and not unique. But every sentence had at least three errors in it. This, this person didn't even run spell check on this piece of fiction and it was too long for the magazine if I remember correctly because the magazine's limit was uh, I think a thousand words at that time and uh, the story was like 1100 but she kept changing little things and sending it in again and I would I would say no thank you but no thank you and she'd change a few things here and there finally she started getting pissy at me you know I don't understand why you're rejecting this over and over again I'm fixing it what's wrong with it I, I don't remember what I wrote her but I wrote her an email back saying something along the lines of look I really appreciate that you really really want to be published by my magazine but this story is just not gonna work and every time you try to clean it up I do appreciate that but uh, you're not cleaning it up enough. It needs a lot more work, and it's probably better. You know, right now I didn't tell her this. I was thinking, God, you're just polishing a turd. You know, it's probably better to just start a brand new story, start something totally from scratch, and you know, write that uh, something fresher, more unique. But uh, I don't remember what happened to her. I think she finally got pissed off at being rejected by my magazine and uh, went on to, to haunt someone else like the clown in her story. But uh, I don't know. For all I know, she found another magazine that said, you know, hey, this is awesome, and picked up her fiction and, you know, put it out there and, you know, or, or even better than that, took the time to, to clean it up, you know. But um, pff, I get so many submissions in, and I'm a writer too. I need time to work on my own stuff, but I get so many submissions in. I just don't have time to sit around and, you know, tear apart someone's story bit by bit and clean it up and, like I said, spend a good hour per story. And especially with, you know, at the time, uh, I had, well, at the time I was running one daily magazine, but I was also going to school full-time, uh, working on my, my bachelor's degree in English. And uh, after that, as I, when I finished school, I filled the time by uh, creating a number of other magazines. I created uh, Daily Love uh, after, after a weird year. And, uh, no, I created Yesteryear Fiction after Weird Year. I created Yesteryear Fiction on um, January 1st, uh, 2010, then went on to create Daily Love on uh, March 30th, 2010. And uh, a Weird Year was created in October of 2009, so it's, it's been around for quite a while now. But um, And then just kept creating from there and there, you know, eventually created uh, the science fiction magazine that I have called um, Farther Stars Than These. 
uh, which uh, created, I think it was last year. Uh, same thing with Linguistic Erosion, which is sort of a freeform uh, flash fiction, any genre. Created uh, Leaves of Ink, which is poetry only. And uh, what is another one? There's another one in there, I think, that I created. God, there's so many of them that I've lost track. I know there were a couple that I created that were total duds. I didn't get any any traffic or any exposure so I just kind of closed them down after a while one of them was uh, Flaming Film Reel and that was fun Flaming Film Reel I thought you know um, I thought hey there's all these cool videos on YouTube and I really enjoy going on there and watching these sort of amateur science fiction productions there's some really great ones on there um, There's a, and if you type in um, I think independent sci-fi film on Google uh, there's a couple articles that will come up that will show you just a whole series of them that are actually extremely well done by you know kids in their backyard or or small studios and and things like that just really neat little short things like 15 minutes long each one they're they're really well done there's a couple that were in there that really uh stunned me can't really uh remember their names but uh i remember there was one that really stood out where um there was this uh uh, the, the idea was that there was some sort of uh, off-brand medication, you know, the prevalence of off-brand medication, I think, was the message in the world. People, you know, going to going to third-world countries, and then there being certain impurities in the medications that they pick up there, and uh, these impurities uh, leading to uh, strange mutations in people with weird blood types, and, and it had some really creepy scenes of these weird mutated people, you know, sort of attacking other well attacking things and being shot by cops and and there was this this really creepy scene where uh this person's in an office building in the dark and kind of working in the office and and hears like a strange noise or something or sees something out of the corner of the eye and and like goes and looks and there's nothing there and you know keeps looking and stuff like that and you know something's there but the person in the office doesn't know it and and finally there's a moment where there's like a noise or something and the person you know, has, has given up at this point, figures that it's just their imagination. But there's a noise, and the person turns around, and there's this weird, creepy, naked, mutant humanoid just kind of hanging in the doorway, staring. And they stare at each other for like half a second, and then the thing silently just takes off. And it's creepy. It's really creepy, because it's one of those wonderful things that, you know, like, really well done horror, where you have no idea what's going on. It's just weird, and the weirdness makes your spine tingle. But... There's enough cool movies like this out there that I figured, well, hey, why not create a, a magazine, as it were, you know, like in the same format as my others, but the idea would be that uh, people would send me their videos, and uh, like this, these little studios would send me their little YouTube videos, and um, then uh, I would put them on there, I would watch them, and I would write a quick review about each one, and then once a week there would be a new review, a new video with a new review, and... Um, I thought it was a brilliant idea. I think I told even some people I knew. I know a few people in very small studios. And I told them, hey, this is right up your alley. This is something that, tell your friends, you know. Tell everybody. I think that we could really do something cool with this. And uh, the answer I got back was, you know, the usual. When a project probably isn't meant to be. Which is things like, you know, oh, well, that's great. That's cool. But, uh, no, th you know, well, I'll get back to you. You know, I'll get back to you. That kind of thing. And I sat with Flaming Film Reel with a, a notification on the front page saying something like, coming soon. You know, I kept backing up the date for probably a year. I was that hopeful. I figured, well, if I just keep backing up the date, you know, opening August or whatever, opening December, I keep, you know, backing it off. Eventually someone will come in and say, oh, this site is awesome. Here's my video. I'm telling all my friends and it's going to be great. And I'd have a flood of material and wouldn't have to worry about it. But... You know, like I said, probably not meant to be, not a single submission, not a single episode. So that particular one got closed down. There was another one I had this great idea. You know, the idea was purchase progress. That was the idea. And I thought, you know, what's a great way to get people to buy uh, art that artists create? Um, you know, tie it into activism. Why not? Sounds like a brilliant idea to me, you know. And the idea was artists who want to sell more material you know, artists, regardless of what kind of art they do, whether they're sculptors or musicians or authors like me, you know, uh, they make a pledge. They say, if you buy this many copies or if I make this amount of money, I will 
you know, go out and plant a tree, or I will, um, I don't know, something that's supposed to make the world a better place. I will give a hundred people hugs, you know, things like that. And uh, I thought, hey, this would be awesome, because most people that I know who are artists are also politically active, and they probably want to sell more, so I mean, it seemed like it seemed like a brilliant idea. And uh, I put out the word. I said, hey, Purchase Progress, come check it out. You know, if you're interested in, in spending, if you don't have any time to make any change in the world, you can always purchase art, and these artists will go and make positive change for you. And it's good for the artists because the artists can go out and, uh, you know, they get more money, they get more sales that way, and they can do good things for the world and, and whatnot. And, but uh, that one didn't get a single submission either, so I guess that wasn't meant to be. But... So that was that was interesting though. I thought that was a, a really great idea, and uh, I don't know if any. I, I even put a profile up there for myself. Um, I don't know if if anybody if anybody bought anything through it, but I did a few of the challenges. Uh, one of them I think was to to plant a, a garden out uh, at the complex where I live, and uh, I did that. I actually went out and planted a garden, but. Um, and I still have it, actually. It's got a couple fruit trees in it. One of them is a, a, a peach tree that actually bloomed uh, this year, which surprised the hell out of me because it's just dark beyond all belief in the backyard. Very dark. And uh, yet, you know, I go out there one day looking at this thing, and it's a total stick. It's just, you know, not going anywhere. It looks like it's totally dead. I was about ready to give up on it and just, you know, leave the stick sticking out of the ground to sort of a you know grave marker for the garden that you know might have been but uh it uh, actually leafed out and blossomed i go out there then you know just literally that that sharp of a difference one day it's a stick the next day it's all leaves and flowers and surprised me made me happy made me hopeful for the other sticks in the yard uh that i thought had died during the winter and um but uh, 12 blossoms the peach tree had, so that was really inspiring. But then there was a rain, and I think they might have knocked all the blossoms off. She might not get any fruit this year. I have another friend who actually told me that there's actually birds in this area, too, that will come down and eat the blossoms, so you don't get any fruit that way either, and that kind of that kind of pissed me off. So it might have been birds that, that ate them, too, but, um, yeah, you never know. You know, at least the tree's alive. That's what matters. My grapevine came back, and my, my uh, it's leafed out, and my my apricot tree leafed out and put out flowers and and so uh i'm just waiting to see if the if the heirloom tomatoes <laughs> come back this year too we'll see but uh so that was one of the things that i did for for my purchase progress thing was creating a garden i figured you know set up you know set it up you know show people that i'm serious maybe i'll get other people on board but nope you know i know quite a few artists and none of them i don't know how many of them actually knew about it because you know you know how it is you post stuff on facebook facebook says well this obviously isn't important and just shuffles it away and no one sees it i mean it may have been one of those kind of situations too i don't know but it seems like none of the artists and it wasn't just facebook i posted on actually either i posted on all my networks i've got uh accounts on facebook tumblr google plus twitter and then when i launch something i put it out there you know it hits every one of those channels because I want to share my stuff with the world. I want the world to know, hey, here's my latest project. I would love to work with you, and let's get this going, you know. And it's not like I'm some somebody who's sitting around, you know, saying, hey, 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 at last, my latest attempt to fleece money from other artists. No, I mean, these are things that I put together, you know, with the goal, number one, of helping the world. Because, let me tell you, uh, Daily Love is my most uh, prosperous site and it only brings in a probably <laughs> it, it pays for the other sites it brings in probably 80 or 100 dollars a year just by itself uh, in a whole year and that you know being my highest grossing site now lots of my other sites don't make any money at all throughout the whole year and uh so it, it pays for the others i think i end up with about oh probably probably 50 bucks after costs uh for the websites i run now that will change uh, in theory, if they become a lot more popular, but then you know if that changes and I start <laughs> start getting in some nice nice chunk of cheddar from uh, this work that I'm doing as an editor, then I'll be more inclined to do more of it. But at the at the moment, it's kind of like you got you got to run off of what sounds cool, you know, and what sounds cool to me 
Uh, might not necessarily sound cool to other people uh, at the time, I suppose, and that's probably the projects that fail are the ones that sound cool to me, but not to other people. But uh, like I said, I was kind of surprised about purchase progress since I figured that, you know, almost all the artists I know are interested in, in social change, but they don't have any money to, to really do much. It seems to be the thing, you know, if you've, if you've got the money for social change, you don't have the time, and if you have the time for social change, you don't have the money. And uh, so if we're going to do anything to make this world a better place, and it's a pretty awesome place already in a lot of ways, you know, um, but if we're going to do anything to make this world a better place, we got to work together. The people with the money and the people with the time got to work together. they got to come together to, you know, create a better place. And when I say I think the world's a pretty good place, I know there's a lot of screwed up stuff that's happening. There is. All over the world, there's screwed up stuff happening. I you know there is no doubt about it um but at the same time we also live in a wonderful time where we have the internet and people say oh goodness the internet yeah right like that's such a good thing all people do is look at cat pictures on facebook no that's what a lot of people do there are other people who use facebook to you know overthrow the government not the u.s government but like you know uh, well, maybe they do. I don't know. But, you know, the, the government in, the, in some of these third world countries where they have an oppressive government, they actually can use Facebook as a, as a means to sort of communicate back and forth, which is why a lot of these, these countries actually have that, that ability to turn off the Internet uh, or turn, turn off the Internet. You know, yeah, just turn the Internet off. Turn off their country's access to the Internet. Uh, so that uh, they can keep insurgents from communicating and, and keep people from uploading videos of police brutality to the Internet. I mean, 1970s, you know, how did you find out about police brutality? You found out about it, you know, third hand. Oh, so-and-so's brother, you hear about him? He got the crap beaten out of him by a cop the other day. Oh, really? That No, cops are good. No, no, no I'm serious. Well, that's jacked, and then you move on. You know, but today... You pull out your phone, you know, or like some something happens. Some, and I'm not saying cops are bad. I know I know personally a number of great cops. I know a number of cops who are excellent individuals. But I also know that it's a very stressful job, and sometimes some of those people crack uh, from working too hard, or maybe it's a power trip. I don't know. But there are some people who crack and do things they shouldn't. And for those situations, it's cool that you know if they when they crack and they start damaging people or property. Uh, anybody on the street can just whip out a phone, you know, take picture, take video, and upload it online and share it with the whole world. And then suddenly there's an there's an outcry, and uh, the uh, people who are supposed to be protecting us are held to that standard instead of being allowed to just get away with whatever they want because they protect us from people who are truly uh, bad, <laughs> bad individuals. <laughs> you know, you know, I I love that um, the purpose of law enforcement is to protect us from those who could really screw up our world, um, you know, as, as individuals. I don't mean like, you know, cops as supermen who fly to, you know, other sides of the globe to combat people with nukes, but, you know, um, I do I do think that they protect us in our more microcosm or macrocosm world, I suppose you could say. And uh, they they do a lot of they do a lot of hard work. I mean I knew I knew a woman who was um, she was a point the, the point woman <laughs> uh, uh, for a SWAT team and uh, she was pretty badass and uh, you know I just think of you know later on in her life she got to be a little weird and uh, you know I don't know a little drunk on power I suppose I don't know exactly what happened there it's just a friend of a friend kind of a thing someone I, I kind of knew on the on the outer edge um, but uh, you know I think how do you look at this person? Do you look at her as someone who's kind of wacko now? Or do you look at her as someone who, you know, maybe... I'm not saying that it's good that she's or that she deserves to be wacko. But rather, damn, she made a hell of a sacrifice for us. I mean, point woman for the SWAT team. Kicking down doors. You know, uh, busting... Massive drug busts. Stuff like that. This woman definitely did a lot of good for us. And um, I'm not I'm not a total I'm not a total square. I want to say you know I don't believe that you know if the U.S. government says it's illegal, then it you know it's evil. Um, I think that uh, to each his own has always been my policy. I'm I am kind of square in that uh, 
the hardest drug I do is caffeine. And uh, maybe uh, uh, people have teased me about this. Maybe a couple of fingers of wine here and there. I like the sweet stuff. I like, you know, Moscato and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's proper for us as individuals, regardless of our preferences, to tell other people what they can't do if they're not hurting anybody. And, you know, somebody who tokes up on weed all the time, are they really hurting anybody? You know, I had a, I had a, a, a friend... Let's leave it at that. I had a friend uh, a couple years ago who I was dating um, that uh, would just, she would go through marijuana like there was no tomorrow. And, uh, you know, she still, she she had, you know, didn't have a life that I wanted to live. I didn't want to live, wanted to want to be a part of her life, which is one of the reasons why it, it didn't last. I didn't want to live that kind of life. I didn't want to be... You know, they they didn't want to wake and bake and go right back to sleep on my days off. I wanted, on my days off, I'm kind of a workaholic. You know, I I get up, I start checking my email before I even have coffee. I start handling things that come in, you know, and, um, you know, maybe that's my addiction. Maybe my addiction is work. But, uh, you know, she was one of those kind of people that would, that, that lived that life. And, hey, cool, awesome. I'm glad she found something that she liked to do. And she wasn't one of those people that, you know, is living off the system either. This woman had a full-time job. You know, she was a, a productive member of society, as they say. She was totally plugged into the matrix, as it were. You know, I, I love dropping these kind of terms. Kind of, I laugh at a lot of a lot of stuff that's out there. I think, you know, nobody really knows what's going on, you know, in anything or in regards to anything. I think we all have little pieces of the puzzle, little pieces of objective truth, and we're all just kind of (laughs) extrapolating and flailing in the darkness trying to figure out what the hell is going on. But, um, you know, she was was a a, uh, responsible individual who, you know, uh, paid her taxes, went to work on time, you know, worked at a gym of all things. And uh, you know, she she made a she made a difference in the world through that way. She kept the system going. And if someone keeps the system going, which is sort of the purpose of government, isn't it, is to is to maintain the system, is to make sure that the system continues um, you know, to be a system so we still have a civilization. If she's still contributing to the system in such a way that uh, you know, it, it helps or it continues to to support the system. She's not falling out of the system. She's not a burden upon the system. She's doing her job. She's showing up on time. You know, she's paying her taxes. She's buying gasoline, doing all these sorts of things. Why does it matter? Why should the government be able to to crack down on her and throw her into jail? You know, I don't think they have. Um, But, you know, and she's not the only person either. There's lots of people out there. Lots of people. I think I don't remember what the statistics were, but I remember reading statistics a while ago that about the number of people who admitted to smoking marijuana on a regular basis uh, in the uh, United States, and it was staggering. If I remember correctly, it's more than half the population of the United States <laughs> smokes an illegal drug. Um, and hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. If that's what they need to relax, so that you know they can go on with their lives. We live in a very uh, fast-paced, stressful civilization, you know, the most uh, socially connected civilization that we know of in the history of the human race, uh, why shouldn't they be allowed to, to indulge like that if they're, you know, keeping up with their responsibilities and they're not hurting anyone? I mean, there are plenty of people who are allowed to go out and just get totally, you know, totally shit-faced on alcohol at clubs and they drive home and they, you know, these people, they these people... Yeah, it's illegal to drink and drive, and I don't recommend it. I know plenty of people who've gotten D... Well, not plenty of people. I know a couple of people whose lives have been utterly ruined by DUIs, so I do not recommend it whatsoever. But I feel like if people can go out to, tr- to go out to clubs and get totally smashed, then um, it's kind of ridiculous for people not to be able to smoke uh, an herb that grows naturally um, in their off time. Uh, so that they can cope with the world. I mean, that's what these these sorts of things, caffeine, you know, alcohol, marijuana, you name it, that's the purpose, isn't it? 
you know, no matter how hard the drug is or how illegal it is, that is the purpose, is sort of to deal with reality, deal with the, the world around us. You know, caffeine, for example, my drug of choice. Caffeine, how does that help me deal with the world around me? Well, it, it helps me uh, kick my brain into gear in the morning, you know. I wake up, I wake up at about probably 70%, you know, awareness and awakeness. But uh, the coffee gives me that extra 30%, you know, and uh, sometimes I, you know, if I'm particularly stressed out over a long period of time, um, I'll, you know, go and, and uh, uh, I'll forego the cup of coffee or, or uh, sometimes if I need it, I'll, I'll drink, the, I'll get the cup of coffee first, not even open my email, just get the cup of coffee first, give myself a chance to wake up, you know, and then deal with the world. You know, could I deal with the world without the cup of coffee? Yeah. You know, I'm sure people say the same thing about alcohol. <laughs> Could I deal with the world without getting totally drunk in the morning? Well, yeah. You know, could I deal with the world without get without uh, you know a cup of coffee in the morning? Uh, probably. You know, yeah, definitely. Uh, do I want to? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not whatsoever. I uh, the uh, the boost that the coffee gives me, the awareness boost that the coffee gives me, is is worth. Uh, having to go pee every every ten minutes, which you know for for the next hour, which seems to be the uh, sort of the side effect of caffeine, uh, <laughs> but um, and thank goodness caffeine and and uh, you know sugar aren't illegal drugs because that would be I think that would probably be one of those things that uh, the government would do that would ultimately put its its position in such a way that would be very precarious and they would never do it anyway because well I don't know why but probably because there are too many people in office who uh, who realize the economic benefits of, of the workforce being dosed on coffee in the morning so I wonder how many people wouldn't even be able to get you know out of their house in the morning without a cup of coffee I know a few uh, I myself don't like to leave the house in the morning without a cup of coffee you know my wife and I will will uh you know drink coffee uh, always even if we're just going out to do something small like grocery shopping and um you know if there's no coffee in the house well this will be our chance to splurge and drop 10 bucks at starbucks <laughs> you know what i mean uh starbucks i have mixed feelings about i think they're a great company I like their stance on on some of the political issues that they they have uh, the ones that I know about. I don't know about all their political issues. I'm sure I say some of their issues because I'm sure that there are some political issues that they spearhead that you know I could do without. But uh, the one that I do know about offhand is um, is uh, equal rights for uh, gay marriage, which is kind of it's just it's a real topic right now. You know, it's a real um, it's something that's going on actually right this minute. We're still waiting to to hear about whether or not Proposition Eight can be overturned. And that's exciting to me. Um, you know, call me crazy, but I believe that uh, we really should be allowing people to get married to whoever they want. You know, I've seen lots of lots of interesting points of view that fall along the cat on the lines of, you know, what's the argument? The argument is if you allow two men to get married, then soon, you know, men will want to marry dogs and men will want to marry ice cream and stuff like that. But you know, if if um, if that was the case. Didn't they say that about, you know, blacks and whites marrying, interracial marriages? You know, they say, oh, if you let her marry that black man, you know, her daughter will want to marry a goat, you know, or whatever. I'm sure that somebody out there said that at some point. Um, This kind of slippery slope thing doesn't exist. It doesn't exist uh, at all. Um, The uh, slippery slope argument is sort of a flawed one. Sort of. It's a very flawed argument. It shows unoriginal thinking. It shows alarmism. It shows, uh, I want to say stupidity, but I don't like to use a word that harsh to uh, sort of describe people. I think that we're all trying and to figure the world out. And like I said, I think we all have one part of the puzzle, but we don't have the whole puzzle. And uh, so it, it's sort of our job as, as fellow human beings to sort of offer our puzzle piece to other people so that we can all figure out what the hell is going on without uh, being forced into the darkness of ignorance by our own lack of information. So yeah, so me, I'm 100% in uh, favor of people being able to marry whoever they want, you know, and and, uh, 
when we start getting genetic technology or t- technology, uh, genetic engineering technology up to the point where people can, you know, marry clones of themselves or uh, marry, you know, maybe we make extraterrestrial contact or, you know, these sorts of things. People want to marry extraterrestrials. You know, this is an eventuality we may have to face. Right now it's science fiction, but in the future, who knows? And, uh, you know, if that becomes a reality, I think that if someone wants to marry, you know, you know, zit zit from Alpha Centauri or whatever, he should be allowed to, you know, and uh, I don't see a problem with it, you know, as long as no one's getting hurt, you know. Uh, but, um, and even then, as long as no one's getting hurt is kind of a slippery argument because then you have people saying, well, what about people with child brides? And, and what about, you know, sadomasochism and people are getting hurt there, right? And, well, in terms of child brides, in my opinion, I think that's screwed up. I'm just going to come out and say it. Might get flack for it, but you know what? They're kids. Let them grow up. Let them become adults. You know, then you can approach them in that way. They need a chance to actually have a childhood. And this may just be my own lack of of uh, knowledge, you know, or whatever, about uh, how socially mature uh, some kids may be. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like that it seems it seems to me that there should be a line drawn there that people who you know want to get involved with kids should probably wait for those kids to to have a, of a childhood first you know have a chance to grow up just so that they can become fully formed adults before you know they are forced into an adult relationship uh the the other one is um oh the other one i mentioned was sadomasochism of course uh i'm not into that but that doesn't mean that it's you know wrong for other people to be into it you know, I have plenty of friends who uh, do interesting things in the bedroom, and it's none of my business. And uh, I only know it because I have really good hearing. And <laughs> sometimes I see things online that I probably am not supposed to see, uh, you know, just because they're there in public view. Um, I'm not hinting, hinting at anyone here, but, you know, I'm just saying I have seen some things and heard some things and overheard some things. And, and, uh, sadomasochism you know that that s&m crowd that's cool hey that's your thing go for it you know i'm sure that that falls under the category of people getting hurt i don't know i think it hurts to get beat with a whip you know no one's ever done it to me so i'm not speaking you know it's not one of those you know can't you know knock it if you haven't tried it kind of things but uh but uh i don't really want to be beaten with a whip because i think that being beaten with a whip would hurt but if that's your thing and, you know, you're cool with it, uh, I guess that falls into the category of you're not really being hurt technically because you're not sitting there for, you know, days afterwards going, oh, I feel violated. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that is where the line should be drawn is that as long as no one no one is violated, no one's rights are violated, no one's happiness is violated uh, on any side of the equation, then uh, it's cool. You should be able to do whatever you want. As long as no one's being violated, hey, cool. But I've gotten a little off topic here, and uh, and uh, I'll go back to where I, where I was talking about before, which is which is coffee. Starbucks specifically. Uh, so Starbucks, yeah, I admit I do go there once in a while. Um, I like their stance on on equal rights for marriage, um, and uh, that that's not the main reason why I go there. When I do go there, rarely. Uh, I go there because they make a damn good frappuccino, you know, man, uh, coconut, (sighs) you know, I am addicted to those coconut frappuccinos, so much so that when I went into the local Starbucks at the end of summer last year and talked to the guy and and I ordered a coconut frappuccino and, uh, because it was the only Starbucks in the area that I knew of that still had them, that still had the, the syrup because they discontinued the syrup, I was so shocked. I said, oh, my God, you guys are the only ones left. And he said, yeah, we only got about, you know, half the contain- half of one container left. And I said, how, how quickly does that go? And, and he said, oh, oh, about a week, you know, at, at this particular one, at this particular Starbucks. And uh, he said, and I said, oh, I love that stuff so much. I love it so much. Do you guys sell that? And he said, well, I'll sell you the half container for 20 bucks. <laughs> I almost did it. I almost did it. I had 20 bucks in my pocket. I almost did it, but I thought, you know, 
probably shouldn't, probably not the best thing for my health to, you know, be just going coconut, you know, syrup crazy. I don't know what they put in that coconut syrup. It's probably all propylene glycol and high fructose corn syrup with a little bit of coconut flavoring, but I don't know. And, you know, so since I don't know, I don't really want to find out the hard way by buying it and then going, well, I probably shouldn't drink this, but it's so good. You know, so I did end up going to uh, the local Cost Plus and picking up a a uh, container of coconut flavored uh, syrup that was had like cane sugar or something in it, so it's healthier uh, from from what I've heard from my my friends and family. But uh, I try I try to be health conscious. I think we all try to be a little bit health conscious to some degree, but it is hard sometimes, isn't it? It's like, you know, the healthy food, the organic food, the heirloom food is always three times as expensive as the stuff that, you know, the, the packets of ramen noodles that you get at Costco. You can go to Costco and load up on ramen noodles for like five bucks. And there's your month, you know, five dollar grocery bill for the month. But, uh, you you know, you try eating organic, at, you know, whole foods or whole paycheck, as some of the people I know call it. Um, and uh, you're looking at a six hundred to a thousand dollar grocery bill with two people and that's eating conservatively I mean my wife and I we have meat with probably probably 70 percent of our meals we have meat you know on the side and not huge portions either just enough that we get you know some good protein because there's a lot of research that indicates that yes you know we do need meat once in a while uh, in small portions because our closest living relatives the cousin cousins sort of in the evolutionary tree are these gombi chimps which hunt you know monkeys and uh, tear them apart and eat them and share them and whatnot you know so we do we do need a little bit of meat you know um, heck our there's a lot of research that indicates our, our ancestors spent millions of years wandering around on the African savanna surviving on tubers which is things like you know yams and potatoes and uh, and uh, the breaking the marrow out of the kills that were left by lions and 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 whatnot. So there's your steak and potatoes right there. Not necessarily steak, but a little fattier than steak, but but still a, a meat protein that uh, increases that was critical for an increase in brain size, which eventually led to us being fully modern. Anyway, so you know you go to Whole Foods and you go to get a relatively conservative. Um, grocery uh load and you know you're you're looking at at least six hundred dollars in a month for two people whereas five dollars for ramen and so yeah you know you should eat healthy you should eat that organic stuff you should eat the gluten-free you know you notice that when you eat you know stuff that's been raised on a farm with grass and all this you know the heirloom and and uh you know heck the stuff that comes from my mom's farm uh is it's amazingly filling you know um okay here you go how about this i like to make stew during the winter time here and there in the crock pot it's something that's tasty you know you throw a couple things in a crock pot let the crock pot boil for eight hours you've got dinner you don't even have to touch it you just throw the stuff in there and go right so you make a crock pot of stew with uh, meat from the like uh, from with meat from Costco or Safeway or whatever one of these companies, and uh, you know your standard you know USDA approved meat and from Belize or or wherever it's from, <laughs> and uh, you know you, you throw a couple pieces of that in the crock pot with some potatoes and some carrots and some celery and some pepper and garlic and and onions and things like that make a really tasty stew and you know i'll eat two or three bowls before i get full and i'm not you know a big guy um tall uh fast metabolism but you know two 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 to three bowls for dinner two to three bowls for lunch two to three bowls sometimes for breakfast and uh then you get you try the same recipe instead of using meat from uh, meat and vegetables from uh, a supermarket or a big box store. Uh, you use fruit and or not fruit, but you use vegetables and meat from a local farm where they uh, raise everything organically. You know the the animals are allowed to wander and get a little gamey and whatnot. And uh, one bowl you can't even finish one bowl. It's just that nutritionally dense. One bowl. And you can go the whole day. I made lamb stew with uh, meat from my mother's farm. And uh, I was able to go on a winter day shivering. 
I was able to go for the whole day without feeling hungry with just one bowl of that lamb stew. And it was good, and I don't even like lamb, but I like the lamb that comes from her ranch. It's good. And, uh, but, um, so you try to eat healthy. You try to eat healthy. You try to get the, the stuff that's good for you. Uh, but uh, sometimes you just don't have enough money, and uh, the ramen starts looking real good, you know, which is kind of sad. I think that uh, if things are good for us, then why are we making the stuff that's bad for us? Why can't we just make the stuff that's good for us? It seems kind of like common sense to me, you know, but, uh, and I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who would say, oh, you know, you're, it's because they're trying to kill us off. These big corporations realize we have an overpopulation problem. They're all trying to kill us off. And whew, I don't know. Maybe. Who am I to say? I don't own a big corporation. <laughs> and none of the people who say that to me do either from what I've seen. But uh, it could be the case. Then you also have people talking about the underpopulation bomb, the demographic winter thing, which is interesting, which is happening in uh, in Western civilization. Uh, from from what I've heard and the research I've read, and it's becoming you know when it first came out and uh, it scared me. Demographic winter. I heard about it probably. It's probably been five years now. I heard about it, and I remember when I heard about it first. I thought, wow, there's there's something trippy. Well, my entire life, I had been told that uh, you know we have too many people, and that you know you you watch movies like Soylent Green, you know, where overpopulation is a huge fear oh my god you know we're gonna breed ourselves out of all the food in the world and we're going to end up you know like crickets in a jar eventually eating one another and that was sort of the future that i thought i thought well you know people are gonna breed like crazy you know i know that uh, there are members of i mean all the evidence in my in my life indicated that my great grandma had seven sisters and they all had seven kids you know after that in the family it kind of narrowed down a little i think there's uh you know there's like me and my cousin and that's it on my generation in terms of biological relatives uh but um but uh anyway um so we always had this i always had this thought that there would be an overpopulation problem and that it was sort of a given, but that maybe we might reach a point where we would be able to send people to other planets to colonize, and if we colonize other worlds, then overpopulation is a good thing, because it's good to sort of spread your seed out a little bit. You don't want all your eggs in one basket, you know, and a rock comes, like the one that, you know, killed off the dinosaurs, but a rock comes and, and hits the Earth, and people are only on the Earth, well, people are kind of screwed, don't you think? So wouldn't it be good to sort of expand outward and whatnot, and, and to expand outward and have a big population capable of sort of, you know, colonizing the universe in some potential future where we actually have faster-than-light travel sort of handled and whatnot? Uh, it would be good to have a large population base. Um, but, uh, so I've always thought, well, maybe that'll happen in my lifetime. I've been, always been idealistic. I've always believed that, you know, something like the Alcubierre Drive might really pay off and might take us to other worlds and and i still hope that and i know that i heard something that darpa is working on that particular drive now so that's exciting you know hopefully that goes somewhere i'd love to be able to to have a, a ranch you know on the on the rolling pasture of mars <laughs> you know that would be that would be interesting um you know be able to take a take a week and and go to go check out tosetti and see what all the buzz is about you know something like that visit various locations from my science fiction books that I've written, you know, different stars and, and see how different they are from <laughs> from the sort of sci-fi thing that I put together. Anyway, um, uh, so underpopulation bomb. The uh, I've always always believed that there was an overpopulation problem, but that it would sort of be unlocked. It would it would become a problem and it would be unlocked by faster than light travel. And then we'd all be able to have as many kids as we wanted and have a wonderful time and sort of move on, you know, and it would be great because people having kids right and left. But then, you know, I was exposed to this idea of the underpopulation bomb about five years ago, and uh, it was it was uh, in a class. It was in a, in a class I was taking that was on uh, recreational facilities management, something like that, you know, like basically managing natural natural resources, um, natural parks, or national parks, stuff like that, state parks, uh, gyms, you know, things that fall into the category of places where you go to, you know, do recreational activities, uh, besides the bed. But, uh, you know, the uh, in this class, there, this guy forced us to watch, well, it didn't force us to watch as part of the curriculum, and it wasn't, wasn't like I was trying to not watch it, 
uh, brought up a video for us to watch that was called, uh, it was talking about the demographic winter. Blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. The idea that we have countries in the world now with a negative population growth uh, value. Countries like Japan that actually uh, are losing population because people aren't breeding enough. And that there are some European countries, European countries, that have leveled off. And that there are more and more countries that are sort of leveling off or falling away. And uh, when I saw this video, it was uh, it was a sort of a fundamentalist production. And uh, they had good figures, though. And I thought, well, considering the source, you know, I know a lot of people aren't going to buy this. You know, when they say, we need to breed for Jesus, you know, not a lot of people are going to listen to that. But, um, you know, when they've got good figures, you start to go, hmm. And I remember talking to people about it, and they said, well, where'd you hear this? And I said, oh, this fundamentalist video that I, I was watching, this Christian scientist production or whatever. And and they go, oh, well, that's just malarkey. They just want us to, to breed like crazy because they think God will give us a new earth. And, and I thought, well, <laughs> the figures matched. You know, yeah, you want to consider the source of any argument, but at the same time, if the figures match, <laughs> maybe you should pay attention. You know, that's like that's like people saying global warming isn't happening, you know, and, and yet we have temperatures rising all across the world. And people say there are different causes for that, you know, and and uh, and uh, there may be maybe it's not just one cause. You know, I have a sneaking suspicion that it is anthropocentric that it is our fault but uh you know there's also a lot of literature you read out there that indicates a lot of other things might be going on simultaneously but that's neither here nor there you know the point is that when people discount global warming just because you know the spokesperson for it is a democrat that falls under the same sort of you know willful ignorance as discounting figures that indicate demographic winter is a real thing just because it comes from the Christian Science Monitor or whatever whatever the organization was that put this information out there. I don't remember exactly what group it was that put this out there. I just remember that it was it was a, a very fundamentalist production. So I kind of filed that away in the back of my brain and, and talked to a few people about it and you know thought well that's an interesting thing to potentially have to deal with in in, in my lifetime. And um, I uh, didn't really think too much about it, so I brought it up here and there in conversation in the years after. But uh, the other day, I randomly ran across an article. It was something like the the top 150 fears of the world's smartest people, and and I'm I'm a sucker for shit like that. So of course I, I read the article, and uh, one of the things in the article was a scientist talking about the quote underpopulation bomb. Now this is the first time I'd ever heard it called this, and I thought underpopulation bomb, huh? This sounds disturbingly like demographic winter. So I read the article. I did a little search. I did some research into it. And uh, same thing, yeah, and it's getting worse, and there's more evidence to indicate that this is going on. So sort of if you weren't afraid, you know, already afraid that for figuring that the world was going to end because of global warming, well, the human right race is, is, is losing people too, uh, which, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about that situation. Um, I think that every human is a star in a sense. They're all, everyone has a, has a, like I said, their own piece of the puzzle to put forth, and that, you know, no matter how much uh, other individuals might look down on one individual each individual has something of value to contribute to the world even if we don't know what it is yet you know even the worst individual you know uh, if you know here's here's an example that might make, get me into trouble adolf hitler let's talk about about adolf hitler he had something to teach didn't he let's see what did adolf hitler have to teach he had to teach that it's not a good idea to be a genocidal fuckhead because not only does it make you an asshole but um, it makes you, uh, it, it hurts a lot of people, which is not cool either. Uh, it uh, destroys a lot of lives and uh, generally causes a lot of just bad, bad stuff going on all the way around. And I know that is an extreme oversimplification. Please don't crucify me <laughs> for glossing over the atrocities of the Nazi party. They were not good folks. I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I do not support them whatsoever. But... Uh, you know, I do believe that um, the Nazi party taught us a lot of important lessons as a species about the importance of <laughs> tolerance and respect and brotherhood and, and, and uh, sort of 
putting ourselves in other others' shoes and realizing that, you know, we wouldn't really like it either if we were shuffled off to concentration camps and, and used in medical experiments and stuff like that. You know, it's it's not sort of falls under the category of, of reaffirming the golden rule, as it were, you know, do unto others uh, so they won't want to do unto you later, that kind of thing. But um, anyway, so I think that everybody, even the worst individuals, uh, has something to teach us, and therefore it's kind of, you know, it's kind of screwed up to hope for a world where the amount of, the number of, of human neurons, as it were, in our civilization's uh, brain worldwide brain you could say it because you know now we're all connected well not all but a lot of us are connected to the internet in a network very much like a brain each of us could be a neuron here I'm contributing my electrical impulses right now through the medium of speech and though my electrical impulses might not trickle into any other neurons human neurons as it were in the brain uh, of our species they might and there might be one idea I might record 10 hour long podcasts of just me talking about my views of the world and stuff that's going on and there might be just one glimmer of something somewhere in one of these podcasts that sticks in someone's brain. And that person goes on and tells their friend, and their friend tells their friend, and then a couple other people talk about it. And someone's kid remembers it when he grows up, and 20 years later, it, you know, saves his life or whatever. I don't know. You know, you never know how far your ideas are going to go. I like to think, because I have a little bit of an ego, and I admit it, I like to think that all my ideas are great ideas, and that they all go all over the world and, you know, make a difference. And, and I would like that, because I like the idea of, of making a difference. I think we all do as human beings. Well, maybe not all of us, but I think a lot of people like the idea of, of making positive changes in the world. The idea of of uh, underpopulation is a little little bit... Uh, it's uh, I think it has benefits and disadvantages, like anything else. Benefits being, you know, it's cool to have uh, less competition for resources, for existing resources. You could say, you know, less people polluting, stuff like that. You could say, there you go. That is a that is a benefit that you could say of underpopulation, of the underpopulation thing. Because I don't think that it will be one of those things where people just stop breeding altogether and then suddenly the human race dies off. I think it's just that as we, you know, get to a certain point and we embrace this certain certain type of Western paradigm, you know, as a species, instead of just as certain nations, uh, our birth rates drop off and stabilize. And, you know, they'll stabilize at a certain point. And, uh, you know, maybe that's, maybe immortality, maybe uh, eternal youth will become a thing within, with, before, or during, or in preparation, or in combination with this whole underpopulation bomb thing, and will be reduced to a certain number of people who will live forever as if they, you know, looking and feeling as if they were in their 20s. I don't know. The universe works in mysterious ways, and that is a really broad, a really long period of time to try to extract a trend from. But disadvantages of underpopulation would be things like, you know, um, that many fewer people to contribute new ideas to our global, you know, internet networked brain, as it were, of, spe of our species. Uh, fewer people to come up with brilliant ideas, you know, fewer people that could potentially be the next Einstein or the next, you know, Richard Feynman or the next Carl Sagan, you know, it's, it's, I like the idea of, of us opening up vast frontiers of space so that we can breed like rabbits <clears throat> and we can end up with a whole bunch of Carl Sagans out there, you know, saying, hey, let's ponder the universe, you know, and, and sort of contributing to really good knowledge that's out there. But, um, you know, so I think that uh, I think that underpopulation, the idea of an underpopulation bomb has some serious some serious problems um, that would need to be looked at, I suppose. Um, <laughs> like I said, I don't think we're all going to die off. I don't think we're going to reach a point where there's just no more humans. I think we're way too tenacious of a cancer uh, upon this world to completely die off. Uh, maybe it'll go like a pendulum, you know, we'll, you know, breed like crazy, go up to a certain number of billion, you know, stop breeding like crazy, go down to a certain number of billion, start breeding like crazy, go back up, you know, like this. Depends on how long we're, we're trapped on, on Earth, you know. I, I deal with a lot of, uh, I, I mention a lot of things that are, are, right now they are science fiction. I freely admit it. They're absolutely science fiction. Right now. 
But, you know, that's what I do. I'm primarily a science fiction writer. That's my area of interest. I've always been into science fiction, and so I like to think about the way that trends will come together in the future. It, it, uh, it's interesting to me. It's interesting to think about the way things might come together, the, the trends that things might follow, or the trends that the human species might follow. But uh, how, did, how did I get on the, the underpopulation bomb? Uh, I was thinking, I was talking about, uh, oh, uh, oh uh, conspiracy theories, I think. People who, people who uh, well, different, different viewpoints, you know, some of which fall into the category of conspiracy theories. And yeah, you know, some conspiracy theories turn out to be wrong, some turn out to be right. Like I said, we all have just one piece of the puzzle. And uh, we're all trying to sort of fumble through the dark. Uh, trying to figure out where the heck we are. I've read some, you know, I've, I, I like to read everything, everything, every point of view. I try to try to absorb a little bit from everybody's point of view, and you know, I think that when you do that, you sort of realize that a lot of people argue with statistics. And uh, it was Mark Twain who said, "There's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics." And uh, statistics are are wonderful way of motivating people. You can say, 97% of the people in the world are dealing with this problem and there is only one way to kick its butt. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And you know, that's a great way to motivate people. But, um, you know, that same statistic, that 97%, I'm sure that, you know, uh, in a lot of cases, when you look at it, you, and you look at other viewpoints of it, there's also a lot of factors that are sort of being ignored and, and numbers that are fudged to come up with that number and things like that. And, and uh, it's one of those things where, you know, do you, do you blow the whistle? Do you say, well, no, that's inaccurate. You know, you can't say 97% of people. It's more like 79, you know, or do you go along with it? I think that's probably something a lot of people who realize these things um, ask themselves because, you know, when you say 97% of the population has this problem, a lot of people are going to jump on board. If you say 79% of the population is having this problem, then a lesser number of people are going to jump on board because the other the rest of the population says, well, it's not, it's not that big of a deal yet. You know, a lot of people, it takes a lot to pry someone's butt off the couch. And I think that's one of the main reasons why people uh, skew and, and warp and, and manipulate statistics to uh, create, to motivate people. And uh, if someone's motivating people to, to uh, work on a cause or to join together to support a cause that uh, you support, what's the right course of action? You know, if you see those figures are manipulated, you know, it's, it's a good cause. You know it's a good cause. You like that people are getting on board with it. But if the numbers aren't 100% kosher, um, should you call those people out on that? Probably, you know. But people will, other people will fall away from the cause. Then the cause will lose steam. You know, if it's a good cause, you know, like, like uh, getting rid of overwhelming student loan debt. <laughs> hint, hint. Here in in the U.S., <laughs> um, you know, something like that. I I don't know if any of those statistics are skewed. I haven't looked into that. I, that is one cause I just am all ahead go for. You know, sort of blinding myself to a lot of other facts and probably to my own detriment I'm sure but I've always been I've always been in support of bills and legislation that say they can help people out of their student loans because I know lots of people lots of people who went into the college system because they were told by many people not just their parents not just the people at the college but by many people that uh, if they went to school they got their college degree they would be guaranteed a good job and by a good job I mean something that makes 30 grand a year or you know 40 grand or 50 grand or 60 grand I'm not talking a, like a good job I'm not talking like something in like the the hundred grand 200 300 grand range those do exist and you do need a college degree for a lot of those but you know I know a lot of people who went to college because they wanted to work you know for the city instead of for McDonald's and that was why they went to college and you know for them to to be saddled with a student loan where they take out five thousand dollars and then they can't pay it you know for a little period so the interest rate gets hiked so now they owe fifteen thousand dollars I have one friend who took out seven thousand five hundred dollars in student loans seven thousand five hundred dollars 
uh, 20 years or 25 years ago, so 20 to 25 years ago, somewhere in that range. And she is now she now has a student loan balance of fifty thousand dollars, over fifty thousand dollars. It's like fifty two or something like that. Over fifty thousand dollars. She took she borrowed seventy five hundred. Over fifty thousand dollars she owes right now, and she's been paying it. You know, I don't know if she's been paying it the whole time. Uh, probably not. I know they like to hike the interest rate when you don't. Um, but uh, heck, my student loan. My student loan has ten thousand dollars worth of interest tacked onto it. You know, is that is that right? I'm sure somebody thinks it is. I'm sure somebody listening to this podcast says, "Hey, man, you know, you know, you got your hand and you dealt it, and that's what you get." But I don't think that. Uh, I think that falls into the category of usury, and uh, I think that a lot of good people that I know are sort of crushed under outrageous student loan debt and. Uh, and I think that it uh, is a terrible thing that needs to be corrected. Now, you know, I don't know what the proper, what the good solution would be, per se. You know, selfishly, I would say, get rid of it all. You know, forgiveness program. I would love that. You know, no more loans. No more credit cards. You know, didn't Iceland do that? I don't know. I haven't read too much on term, terms of the, the, you know, revolution that happened there, but there was some sort of a debt forgiveness program that happened over there. You know, I like to think, hey, you know, wouldn't that be great? Suddenly someone comes on the TV and says, hey, you know all those credit cards you've got? You know all those student loans you owe? <clears throat> you know all this and that that you've been paying money on? Well, guess what? You know, there's legislation that's passed through the government. You don't have to pay any of that. Clean slate. From here on, I would be happy. You know, I don't got that much debt compared to most people I know. Um, I have enough. I have enough that it scares me a bit, you know, when I really think about it. But I don't have anywhere near as much debt as most people. Most Americans have 10 or 20 times the debt that I do. And, uh, you know, I think it would be cool if they didn't have to pay that anymore. I wouldn't mind not having to pay, you know, my student loan anymore. Uh, But, um... I would be okay with legislation that made it where the you know you pay it faithfully for 10 years and then the rest is discharged or you know I'd be happy to pay it for the rest of my life you know as long as my kids didn't have to pay it you know and I could get away with it being $50 a month you know <laughs> something like that without crazy insurance or not insurance but um crazy uh interest rates you know jumping up you know, all the time because I'm taking a lower rate, you know. But, um, so that is one cause I kind of blindly, blindly jump into. And, and I'm not, you know, I read a lot of stuff from a lot of different sources, but, you know, no man, uh, knows everything or no woman knows anything, everything. Uh, although there are some people who would say otherwise, but, um, no one knows everything. And so you're going to get suckered into some things that, you know, you 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 put your you put your emphasis behind because of the fact that they sound like a good cause. I was one of the people that, you know, I admit it. Right, I'm gonna admit it and raise my hand here. I was one of the people that when that whole Coney thing happened, uh, I was on board with it. I, I uh, posted something about it uh, um, online. I thought, yeah, you know, making a difference in the world. I don't know jack shit about Africa. I don't know anything about Africa except, you know, some basic uh, human evolutionary, you know, theory. That's about it. That's what I know about Africa. Uh, and I know there's there's uh, a you know a lot of fighting still going on over there and child soldiers and really screwed up stuff like that. But you know, I am ignorant in that field. I admit it. Um, innocent, I would say rather, not ignorant, because uh, I haven't actively told myself I will not learn about Africa, and that falls under ignorance. But I haven't taken the time because I've taken the time to learn other things. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to defend ignorance here. I'm sure someone would jump on me for that. But I am saying that, you know, we can't all know everything about everything. And, you know, there is a certain amount of stuff that we have to learn for our profession. And I know more about science fiction than anyone else I know. And some would say, well, that's not important information. I would say, well, you know, if it if my knowledge of science fiction allows me to create books and edit books and review books and those, you know, 
edited books and those reviews and, and the books that I write ultimately keep people who you know out there from from committing suicide uh, I think that's probably a good <laughs> I think that's probably a good uh, a good information you know no information is necessarily bad information I'd say there is some information that is more important uh, than others in certain times and places but I don't think there's any information which is useless per se um, but uh, I know I've mentioned suicide twice now in, in, in two podcasts <laughs> but uh, it's something that uh, I, I've it's an issue that I've, I've talked to a lot of people about in my life and uh, people who who were considering suicide and and uh, you know even even myself I've been so low in depression sometimes that I've you know thought well what's the point you know what is the point you know I'd look at my future and say well if I'm just gonna be a nobody and I'm just gonna you know barely be able to make my student loan payment and I'm just gonna be you know this or that or or at the bottom end of the totem pole as it were you know for the rest of my life wouldn't that make me a burden on my family wouldn't my family be better off without me you know what's the point in sticking around why do I believe that if things haven't really changed in the last three years four years that they you know why do I believe that they would change in the next 50 you know but that's kind of a limited viewpoint and uh, when you're in the depths of depression it's it's hard to see that that's a limited viewpoint you just kind of feel like well I'm a piece of shit and that's the end of it and uh, you know I'd sympathize with people who deal with that because I've dealt with that in my own life it sucks it's just it sucks a lot it sucks hard and uh, so I talk about it because I know that it's something that a lot of people deal with you know there are people in my group of friends and family who have said things like you know don't worry about me if I ever get you know too old to <clears throat> to wipe my own butt or you know to work a job or whatever I'm just gonna you know drive my car out into the woods and blam you know and that's terrible it's absolutely terrible these are these are people that I that I know that I've known for years that I love because they're great friends of mine you know and they're saying stuff like this and I think god you know who am I to who am I to say no don't do it you know if they feel like that's the right course of action but at the same time it's not the right course of action think of all the people that you're gonna hurt and you know at the same time there's also that whole notion of um, you know why do people commit suicide well theoretically they do it because they think it will make the world a better place but ultimately it doesn't it just um, it just makes the uh, possibility of making the world a better place no longer existent if you choose to commit suicide uh, you've given up and no the world isn't going to get any better uh, at all you know and no matter what your religion is or if you have a religion at all you know if you believe there's no afterlife well then what the hell's the point of you know offing yourself this is your one shot you've only got like 70 years come on man live it up you know go out there and do something you know don't just don't just go well you know it's not gonna get any better who cares if it doesn't get any better <laughs> at least you're not in oblivion I mean realistically you know and if you're Christian the Bible is pretty clear if I remember correctly it's been I haven't read it in 20 years it's pretty clear not 20 years um, probably 15 years I think it's been but um, <clears throat> it's pretty clear if I remember correctly on the whole idea that if you commit suicide you're not gonna get into heaven and if you're looking for things to get better then that's probably not a good idea because you know what do you think is gonna make things better how how are, if you want things to be better what is better than heaven as it were how are you gonna get to heaven well by living a virtuous life by living a good life by trying to make a difference in the world you know not by offing yourself that doesn't help anybody you know so if if you're out of options and you feel like you're just trapped and life sucks you know yeah it may suck right now but you might also be presented with an opportunity in the near future to make a positive difference in the world you know a truly positive difference in the world so you should just you should hang on you know come on you can do it fight you know fight that depression but you know so so suicide you know is is not the answer and that's kind of a cliche to say that but it really isn't and if you really think about it it doesn't help anybody to off oneself and uh, you know that's something that I, I talk to a lot of people about I say 
you know, hey, um, I talk to them, they say, well, I'm thinking about ending it all, and I'm like, why would you do that? Here's all the reasons why you shouldn't. Here's all the different viewpoints. And, you know, I know these viewpoints because I've run over them myself in my own head, you know. You don't magically come up with these points of view. You come up with them because you've battled the same demons, you know. It's sort of like the old warrior saying, hey, you know, kid, you know, the kid puts on the armor to go battle demons or dragons or whatever, and, you know, it's much better if you're going to go battle demons and dragons and whatnot if you've got a veteran warrior who comes out and says, dude, uh, that armor ain't going to work against those dragons. If you're going to fight dragons and demons... You're going to need to do this with your armor. You need to look at it this way. You need to come in from the left. Think of me that way. A veteran warrior who spent a lot of time dealing with the demons of suicide, as it were. And uh, so that's why I, I bring it up. is because it, it's something that's uh, <clears throat> been very, very uh, prevalent in, in my life. Talk about it. And and I like to think that, you know, talking about it too and, the, and that the stuff that I do prevents people from committing suicide and I know that in, in some cases uh, I am I'm not trying to brag here but I I am kind of proud of this there there is uh, I write under a couple pen names as well and uh, there's one pen name that I write under that I'm not gonna not gonna say the name here because uh, that pen name is still receiving death threats for some of the books that uh, she has written <laughs> But this pen name that's still receiving death threats, um, her her books are, are very controversial. Uh, kind of juvenile humor, but uh, they use juvenile humor, humor to make some very profound uh, social, uh, uh, some very profound points in terms of uh, social interaction and, and to the state of the civilization and, and various viewpoints of, of people and parties and whatnot. And I actually had someone who, who wrote me a letter here, oh, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, uh, to the, the email account for that pen name, uh, saying, look, you know, I spent eight months in um, a, uh, oh, what was it, in a psychiatric facility uh, battling uh, suicidal thoughts and depression and whatnot, you know, I, I was locked up in there, and it was your book, and they this person named the book, the specific book. It was your book that helped me get through that, helped me get to the other side of, you know, battling those demons, helped me realize that there is reason to live in life, you know. And I thought, God, if I do nothing else in my entire life, that right there, even if it was written under a pen name, that the fact that I wrote that book is enough because I, that book saved someone's life, even if only for a little while. You know, I don't, I don't know how long. Hopefully, you know, here's hoping that that kid. I, you know, I, I stayed in contact with him. Here's hoping that that kid, you know, has a bright and long and happy future ahead of him and makes a lot of different, makes a lot of wonderful, happy choices that influence a lot of people in some really great ways. And uh, you know, if I do nothing else in my life, you know, just writing that book, hey, that's enough. It's kind of kind of awe-inspiring to think about, you know. Of all the things you do in your life, the most innocuous might just be the one that that saves a life and influences the whole rest of humanity in a way that uh, is really profound and that uh, really makes your whole existence worthwhile, just that one moment. This was a book that I wrote over the course of one week, you know, one week out of however many decades or centuries, depending on technological advances, uh, I might live that one book that took one week to write that might be the book that might be the book that you know validates my whole existence right there and it's not even it's not even under my name <laughs> <clears throat> but um so anyway we're we're getting a little up there in time so i'm gonna i'm gonna cut this short so i've got more material to to talk about in the future but i kind of like doing these podcasts they're they're fun. They allow me to talk about interesting things. And uh, if you like this podcast, um, this spoken word podcast, leave a comment. Let me know. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm doing these things sort of for fun, for an experiment. You know, I, I like doing them. But uh, if they're just a waste of time, then I'll just leave the ones that I've done up there and, and uh, move on to, to writing other books. If they are 
fun or funny or useful in any way you know they're not just a total waste of time for for everyone involved then uh then I'll keep doing them, but I won't know that you enjoyed them unless uh, you drop a comment. So, drop me a comment. Let me know, and uh, and I'll keep doing them. How's that sound? So this is E. S. Wynn, the Midnight Writer, uh, so called because I write all night and sleep all day, literally. And uh, you can you want to find out more about me. You can visit my publishing company at www.thunderoon.com or visit my main website at uh, eswin.com. All right. Uh, hopefully you all have a great day or evening, wherever you are, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. I'll see you next time. <laughs>